Explorers are cutting edge scientists, amazing researchers, and powerful storytellers. These Explorer classroom events connect students around the world with our National Geographic Explorers for short lessons and extended Q&As. We're now hosting Explorer Classroom every weekday at 2 p.m. Eastern time, in addition to all of our usual events. So if you'd like, I can see you right back here tomorrow. But today, we're very, very lucky to be connecting with Gloria Dickey. Gloria is a journalist reporting on climate change and biodiversity protection all around the world. Today, we're gonna to learn about field reporting and follow her on a recent story about sloth bears from start to finish. But before we do that, I would like to acknowledge that we are joined on screen by several students and we have almost a thousand of you registered to watch online today. I'm so glad to have so many of you out there. Today, our students represent places all around the world. We've got students from Alabama, Alaska, California, Colorado, Delaware, Florida, Georgia, Hawaii, Idaho, Illinois, uh, Indiana, Iowa, Kansas, Kentucky, Maryland, Massachusetts, Michigan, Minnesota, Nebraska, New Jersey, New Mexico, New York, North Carolina, Oregon, Pennsylvania, Puerto Rico, Tennessee, Texas, Virginia, Washington, Washington, DC, Wisconsin, Canada, France, Germany, Indonesia, Ireland, Italy, Peru, Romania, South Africa, and the United Kingdom. I have a couple special shout outs to give today. I wanna to give a shout out to Addie, Anna, Autumn, Caroline and Josiah, Charlotte, Chloe, Cyrus, David, DIS Genoa, Freya, the Grimshaw family, Hadley, Jace, the junior reporter, Tiana Sermons, Kay, Laszlo, Matthew, Mia Bella, Miss Nielna's 11th grade, Miss Kimball's class, Mrs. V's third grade, Miss Burke's sixth graders, Miss Mulcahy, the Oxen Home Group, the Filman family, Riley, Sarah, Sawyer, and Lydia, the Shimke family, the Singh sisters, Sterling, the Stewarts, Topaz, Tiger, and August. Uh, the Wilson family and the Yarbros. That's a lot of you. I tried to grab as many names from, from the YouTube chat bar as I could, but I'm sure that's not all of you. Again, there's an awful lot of you registered today. So if I've missed you, please introduce yourself in the chat bar so I can say hi. But for now, that is plenty from me. It's finally time to turn it over to Gloria for today's Explore Classroom lesson on wildlife journalism. Cool. Thanks, Celeste. So yeah, so I work as an environmental journalist, um, as Celeste said, and I cover issues all over the world from polar bears in the Arctic, uh, to white abalone recovery in California, to panda bears in China, to wolves in Oregon. Um, and today I'm going to talk a little bit to you about kind of how I got into this into this field um, and what, you know, wildlife journalism is, as well as take you along with me on a recent trip that I did, um, supported by National Geographic to India last year. Um, so I'm just going to start uh, by sharing my screen then. Okay. Let's see here. Okay. Can you see? Good. <laughs> All right. I'm just going to move this little. Okay. Um, so there's a panda, which I'm sure most of you recognize. <laughs> And so I guess just to start, let's talk about what journalism is. So most of you will think of journalism maybe as someone who goes to the scene of like, I think like a car crash or a major political event. Um, a lot of scholars have referred to it as the first rough draft of history. So kind of when a journalist goes out and field the information that we're collecting, you know, it kind of forms that foundation of what history books might use, you know, a hundred years later, those initial reports from the scene of, you know, something like the sinking of the Titanic, who was there, what did they document? And that informs our understanding of the world in the long term. Um, and so journalists can work on all different kinds of media. Some people write, some people do radio, some people, you know, are out there with their TV cameras that you might see. Um, but the kind of the motivation and the mission is the same across all those different media types. Um, but the question is, what then is wildlife journalism? So that's a little bit of a smaller niche within journalism. Um, and it's kind of a, a growing niche, I would say, too, especially with all these big environmental issues that we've that we're facing like climate change and you know mass extinction events. Um, so there's more and more people probably in this field than ever before. Um, and so I want to ask, what are some of the current you know big news stories that you can think of that connect to wildlife and to our relationship with nature? Um, and I can give you know Celeste or someone a moment just to see if you guys have any ideas with that. Drop your ideas in the chat bar, and why don't we call on an on-screen group to give us an answer about some big wildlife stories they've heard about recently. Maybe the Singh family? Your microphone's on. Do any of you guys have an idea? Um, we don't have any. We don't have any. 
That's all right. We've got an expert here to help you out. Let's see what the chat bar is saying. Um, the Australian wildfires, climate change, um, all, all sorts of things are coming in. Yeah, I'm, so the Australia bushfires is a really good example. I think a lot of people saw those heartbreaking images of koalas uh, in the news and kind of, I think just today, the Australia government came out with a list of 113 species uh, that will need emergency help after the fires to recover. So everything from echidnas to platypuses. Um, but certainly that, that was a huge um, you know, thing that happened. Everyone was kind of, all eyes were on Australia for a while last year as these fires burned. Um, but I did have one particular story in mind, so I'm going to give you some hints to walk you through that to see if you can think of um, maybe something a little bit more recent even. So what species is this? <laughs> Let's see what people say. It's pretty obvious. So I certainly have a guess. <laughs> maybe someone from on screen can tell me what, what animal this might be. I a guess too. Sophia, your microphone's on. Do you know what animal that is? A bat. It is. And do we know what kind of bat that might be? No, so these are some these are some flying foxes, and this is actually from India. Um, they all go up there and they they sleep during the day. Um, and then what about this animal? Do we know what that animal is? Maybe Andrew does. Let's turn on Andrew's microphone. What animal do you think this is? That is a pangolin. It is a pangolin. And so if we kind of think about all these species, what might what might that connect to that's been in the news lately? We've got the chat bar lighting up with this. Lots of people are onto it. They're all guessing COVID-19. Yes, exactly. So um, this current uh, you know, pandemic that has us all at home and on Zoom today is has its origins uh, in the wildlife, in wildlife or in the wildlife trade rather. Um, so this is something that a lot of virologists have talked about for a long time, which is the potential spillover from wild animals into humans with all different kinds of nasty diseases. You might think of like the Ebola crisis or SARS or Nipah virus. A lot of those, um, you know, have started due to our consumption of wild animals or we're bulldozing their habitat and therefore these, you know, new diseases are kind of spilling out of the forests uh, and in, into cities. Um, and so with the current, uh, pandemic it's thought that perhaps that originated at a, at a wildlife market uh, in China. Um, they're not exactly sure what species it came from, but bats are known to be a really good vector of transmission for causing viruses to jump from an animal like a pangolin, which hosts coronaviruses, into humans. Um, and so it's up to wildlife journalists to make those connections for people so that people aren't just talking about, you know, sort of maybe what's on the ground, what's happening, but let's look at like preventative measures and like how did this start to begin with so that we can stop it from happening again in the future. Um, and the way that I often like to think about, you know, wildlife storytelling is that animals really can't speak for themselves. So we have to figure out a way that we can share their stories and find people to share their stories for them um, in hopes of helping them. Um, so how do we do this? So that's why I'm gonna talk a little bit about journalism and my work. Um, so journalists can come from all different backgrounds. I really liked writing when I was young in school, but I didn't like math. <laughs> and so I was kind of trying to figure out a way that I could still do science and cover science, uh, but use my interest in writing and storytelling instead. Um, I did end up going to school for journalism as well as geography, um, but lots of journalists come from science backgrounds, from history backgrounds, from politics, from language studies. It's, it's kind of all over the map. What I think people share is this general love of storytelling and this kind of curiosity and passion for continuous learning. Um, that's what I certainly like about this industry is that I'm often, you know, meeting new people every day prior to the pandemic. <laughs> you know, I'm going into the field every day. I'm always learning something new. Um, and it's really a job that can also be done normally from anywhere. Typically, I just have my computer with me and I have, you know, an audio recorder and my phone and some notebooks. And that's really all that I need to to do my work. And then, you know, I'm connecting with editors and magazines all over the world while I'm you know, perhaps in India or in the Arctic or South America. It's, um, yeah, it's kind of a backpack type job. Um, so that's what I mentioned. So some of my recent work, I'm currently writing a book on the bears of the world and there's eight species, um, but I've worked on tigers in India. I've worked on anteaters in Ecuador, uh, wolves in Oregon, as I mentioned, polar bears in the Arctic, pandas in China, um, all different kinds of species from the charismatic to the not so charismatic. And that's me in uh, Peru, actually. That's at uh, Waiketcha Biological Field Station last year. Um, this is up in Alaska, another one for someone who's called in from, uh, that's near Fairbanks today at the Large Animal Research Station. So I was working on a story looking at musk ox uh, farming in Alaska. Those are, however, reindeer uh, or perhaps caribou. Um, and so 
typically when I, I, so I work as a freelance journalist, which means that I just work for myself. And so I'm often sending out ideas uh, to different magazine editors whenever I think of something. Um, and so whenever I'm having to come up with an idea, first of all, I'm asking, you know, I might have a topic, but what's the story? And that's a really important distinction for journalists. So like a topic, for example, might be, um, you know, panda conservation in China. Let's use that as an example. Um, but what's like a smaller something narrative that I can give to someone so that they can understand this, this topic. So for example, um, a couple of years ago, I found out that China was building this big new national park for pandas. Um, so that kind of gave me like a very small microcosm with which to examine this larger topic so I could find certain characters and follow them along. Um, and then I also mentioned too, like another really good and important thing is to find like a human character to try and tell that story too. So ideally you might find a scientist or a conservationist on the ground and you can profile their work and they can kind of, they can kind of be that storyteller for you if you don't want to put yourself into the story. So whenever I'm looking for a story idea, I'm often trying to find scientists who might be working on it. I'm giving them a call to see how, you know, how they might sound, if they're going to be entertaining enough for a general audience. Um, and I'll ask about like what research they have happening and if I can, if I can tag along with them. Um, okay, skip forward. So this was one story again that I mentioned that I had done that is a white abalone uh, and they're endangered. And there was a project uh, off the coast of California to try and captive breed these, these animals and then kind of plant them back into the ocean. And so it's been really successful. Um, I've had a great kind of main character who was super passionate about abalone. She had like abalone earrings and an abalone shell engagement ring. And she kind of dedicated her life to trying to save this species and it was actually working. Um, so that was one of my more fun <laughs> stories to do. They, they spend one day every year breeding abalone. So like it's known as like, you know, spawning day. So everyone goes to the lab and there's like hundreds of people trying to, to create these animals for the year. Um, so quick pop quiz, maybe we can look at chat or ask uh, our viewers what they're seeing. So who knows what this bear is? All right, YouTube chat. Bar, go ahead and sound off for what bear that is. We'll give you a little <laughs> start and then we'll head to the Liedelstead family. All right, your microphone is on. Would you give us a guess? What little bear? Yep. It's a polar bear. That's a polar bear. He's pretty easy to identify by his distinctive white coat. What about this bear? All right, chat bar, sound off. We'll give you a little head start and then we're going to go to the Singh family. Can one of you guys let us know which one this is? A grizzly bear. That is a grizzly bear. Yep, looks like he's perhaps up in Alaska there. Uh, and what about this guy? <laughs> All right, you know the drill. Chat bar, we're going to give you a little bit of a head start. All right, and now Andrew, can you help us out? Um, that is a panda. That is a panda. Everyone loves the panda. He does not fall short in terms of online accolades. Uh, and lastly, do we know what this bear is? Ooh, this is a tough one. I love this. Um, we'll give you a little head start. And then Sophia, do you have any guesses on this? Yes. Um, can I say? Please do. Okay, it's a, a black bear. It's not a black bear. It is yeah. related to a black bear, but check out his distinctive little like white mark on his chest. Have you ever seen that on an American black bear? Hmm. We've bear? got some guesses online. We've got moon bear, honey badger, sun bear, fat bear, bad Another, bear. We've got all kinds of, of guesses. A coming. few of those are actually the moon bear and uh, the sun bear do exist. That's actually not either of those species though either. So uh, I'm starting to get some folks saying sloth bear. That would be correct. So I'm going to net walk you through my next work, yeah, there you go, it's a sloth bear <laughs> that I was doing um, in India last year. So sloth bears, there's another perspective of one walking along the road there. Um, they're pretty much native to the Indian subcontinent. They can be found, um, the biggest population is India, but they can also be found in Sri Lanka and in Nepal. They used to be in Bangladesh uh, and Bhutan, but they've presumably uh, gone extinct in those places. Um, and so the most famous sloth bear is Balu from the Jungle Book, although he looks nothing like one, as you might notice. <laughs> sloth bears also prefer to eat insects uh, more so than fruit, uh, as he's seen feasting out on here. Um, and he's gray and he doesn't, yeah. Rudyard, Rudyard Kipling wrote about Balu the bear. Um, and Balu is, I think, the Hindi word for, for bear. But again, he doesn't really look like the actual species. Um, and so of those, of those four bears that I just showed you, which one do you think uh, is the most ferocious or vicious towards humans? 
All right, this time I'm gonna put us onto grid view, EB. Oh, because we're screen sharing, we can't. All right, just give me a show of hands, students. Um, panda bear, most vicious. Hands up, no hands up on screen for panda bear. Polar bear, most vicious. Okay, okay. we got two hands up for that. That's, that's a dark contender so far. Um, grizzly bear. Four hands for Grizzly. Oh, five hands for oh, Grizzly. It's, it's looks nervous. like Grizzly might be the winner. Um, but actually, I think we're all out of hands on screen. <laughs> but you want to take it away, Gloria? Sure. So actually, um, most scientists think that the sloth bear is actually the most aggressive bear towards humans. Um, it typically attacks more people every single year than, you know, brown bears or grizzly bears do worldwide, even though we tend to associate, um, you know, grizzly bears as being kind of the, the big bear that you need to be scared of when you're, when you're hiking. Um, and, you know, a huge factor of that too uh, with sloth bears is that they live so close to so many people in India, whereas perhaps brown bears are off in the wild more so, and they're not quite up close to like villages and cities like we see with sloth bears in India. Um, but they do have a very kind of low startle point nature. You'll see, um, you know, if someone's hiking through the woods, there's they kind of get scared and they'll jump on them or attack them um, defensively. Or they, if you surprise a sloth bear, they're very quick to react and they react very aggressively. Um, and a lot of people think this might be because they live with tigers and the tigers are constantly harassing them. So they kind of go all in. Um, so there are a few more photos. And so last year uh, I traveled to India to look into the issues and the conflicts between people and sloth bears throughout kind of central India as well as western India because this is a pretty big problem across the country where you have poor um, often poor villagers and tribals who rely on the forest to go and to get you know critical products like fuel wood or food um, you know they don't they can't just go to a store and buy those things and when they go into these places uh, you know in the early morning or late at night um, they're often startling and surprising these wild bears and they're getting really viciously attacked and sometimes even killed by these bears. Um, these bears here <laughs> look pretty nice. Uh, most of those are actually rescued bears. So uh, India also had a tradition for a really long time of um, taking these bears as cubs from the wild and teaching them to dance. And they were known as dancing bears across India. Uh, but that practice has since been outlawed. And so all these bears have been rescued and they've moved to, to wildlife refuges like this one. Um, so, yep, as I said, in 2019, National Geographic sent me there and I spent two months traveling across the country interviewing people who'd been attacked, like this man that you see me with here, uh, by these bears and about their experience, like what, you know, what was happening when they were going to the forest, what were they collecting, were they with people, were they alone, to try to understand, like, why these things are happening. Um, and that was important because a lot of these villagers are then killing the sloth bears in revenge um, because they're scared of them. You know, if a sloth bear starts wandering too close to a village, you know, they're pulling out clubs and they're beating them to death. And so scientists really want to understand how to be able to stop this um, because they are a vulnerable species under the IUCN. There's probably like 7,000 to 10,000 uh, sloth bears remaining in the world. Um, and so they don't want people killing them. <laughs> they want to try and figure out some coexistence strategies with sloth bears. Um, and so I kind of have just a little map here, and that's Kana Tiger Reserve. It's perhaps one of the most famous tiger reserves uh, in India, and it's in the uh, state of Madhya Pradesh, which is central India, and that was my first stop, was to go and talk to some people in an area called the, the Kana Pench Corridor, which is kind of an attack hotspot in India. A lot of sloth bear attacks on people happen there each year. Um, and so this was the village of Beltola that I went to. Um, and as you can see, it's like a very small little village. And then you have the forest right behind it. And that's kind of the tiger reserve or like this, this area that they call the human wildlife interface. So it's kind of where humans can move through and go in uh, unrestrained. But there's also things like leopards and tigers and sloth bears in these woods as well. So it can be a very risky activity to do that. Um, and so these were some of the people that I spoke to who had been attacked by bears recently. Um, this man on the left, he had both his both his legs were attacked when he went in to collect mushrooms from the forest. Um, I think he was with some friends and they'd separated and he'd gone off on his own. Um, and uh, he tried to climb a tree to escape, but the bears pulled him back down and they'd he couldn't walk for months and he was on bed rest um, and he had to get himself out of the forest uh, to get back to his village. Um, the man on the bottom right corner, he had also been collecting mushrooms. I guess that's a popular thing in the area. Um, and he'd been separated from his friends when the bears, I think two bears had attacked him. Um, and it kind of ripped, as you can see, his arms been all ripped up. Um, 
and he was about six hours away from the hospital and so eventually he was able to get there his friends helped him he went on a motorbike with like his arm dangling off um and he has some metal pins in his arm but he can't afford to go back to the hospital to get them removed now even though he's he's healed um and then this girl on the top right she was uh seven years old when she heard that there was a sloth bear running through the village and she was excited and so she ran out to see the bear and it had uh, mauled her face a little bit. Um, and so all of these people were very afraid of bears when I spoke to them, um, you know, they kind of, I mean, I think India can definitely be commended for living so close with wildlife. I think that we actually, you know, in North America have a much uh, lower tolerance for any kind of attack. Like they don't go off and then kill, you know, the police and authorities don't typically kill the bears that do these things. Um, but a lot of people are very fearful of bears um, and they might form mobs, as I said, to, to kill the bears in revenge at times. Um, and so again, this is just kind of showing like this is where the village ends and like the forest starts right there. So it's, these people don't have much space when it comes to avoiding these kinds of conflicts. Um, and these were just two other people, the, the family on the left, um, their husband and father, he was um, collecting mawa flowers early in the morning uh, and he was attacked, uh, but he lived. And the girl on the right as well, she was with her family and they were collecting bamboo and a sloth bear came from behind her and it attacked her and it had, it had scalped her almost. And so she'd been in the hospital for several weeks and had gotten a lot of stitches. Um, and you know, people were saying things like, I hate the bear after this. It really changes their attitudes towards wildlife. Um, so there's another sloth bear captive. Obviously, we did not get too close to them in the wild. Uh, and that's just showing the dancing bear history as well. So that's kind of what they, what they would do in India. Um, and so by the end of my two months in India, I, I, you know, I talked to dozens of people like those that I showed who'd, who'd had run-ins with bears. I talked to a bunch of scientists who were working on possible solutions to stop these conflicts. And, um, you know, some of the sort of the simple things they recommended was always going with your group. Don't split up from your group when you're going into the forest, um, changing what times you're going at. So don't go quite so early in the morning when a bear might not be able to see you. Um, and the other thing that a lot of um, conservationists were pushing for was trying to keep bears more like the core of wildlife areas by planting species and, you know, moving termites so that they're not like wandering out as far into areas where people might be, that you're kind of sequestering the bears in this really small space. Um, that's meeting all of their habitat and food needs. So they, they don't need to, to go out into that human wildlife interface. Um, and so, yeah, uh, that's mostly it. Um, you know, ideally telling the story will perhaps, you know, disperse some, some wisdom and help people to cohabitate <laughs> with these bears or to have a bit more tolerance towards them and to save both bears and people's lives uh, moving forward. Um, I don't know if I can play this video. Let's see, here we go. And so that is one of the little rescued sloth bears that I saw. They're very like stuffy. They sniff a lot because um, typically they're like going along the, the forest floor looking for termites. Um, that's their favorite food. But he was giving me a pretty, a pretty big sniff there. And this is where I put all of my work. And let's move to the question portion. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Gloria. That was wonderful. A little bit heavy, but but such an important story. I, I think we look at these really charismatic species with those great big eyes and all their beautiful fur, and we we sort of want to to treat them like pets. And I think this is a really good reminder that that wildlife is very very wild out there, and that coexistence is the goal. So, mm -hmm. if you're up here on screen with us, get those nice loud voices ready. If you're watching at home on YouTube, start sending us your questions in the chat bar. Uh, you only need to send in each question one time. We're keeping track of them as they come in. If later today you maybe do a follow-up activity, maybe you found something in the educator guide or the family guide that you want to do, maybe draw a picture, write a story, make a video, something like that, please send that to us as well as any pictures you have, whatever, um, at Nat Geo Education and hashtag Explore Classroom on Twitter. That will make sure that Gloria gets the chance to see all of your amazing work. But again, now it's time for questions. So we've got, we've got so many coming in already, but it's a, a bit of a fight happening in the chat bar. Edward and many others are thinking that it's the sloth bears that are the problem and, and send in a little hate their way. And Cameron and some others are thinking it's the people. How do you feel about this coexistence issue? Who do you think needs to, to give more? 
I would say it's, it's neither people's fault. I mean, a lot of the people who are living in these areas are very poor. They don't, they don't have a lot of choices in terms of being able to access things that they need. Um, you know, India has 1.3 billion people and then only so much land. Um, and considering that, you know, I think that they are quite tolerant towards wild animals compared to, you know, if, if a grizzly bear attacks, you know, a hiker or something in North America, like we typically go out and we kill that bear, uh, which is wildly different than what, you know, India does. Um, and I think, you know, it's, we can't really tell the, we can't really tell the sloth bear to, to change its behavior. I think, you know, in terms of, you know, what might be done, um, it's really kind of comes down, I think, to the government uh, trying to create more space for these animals. And a lot of people are concerned in India, for example, that the tiger tends to get all the attention on, you know, when conservation is done in India, it's typically done to save tigers and it might not actually be addressing the, the food or the habitat needs of sloth bears. So they're kind of getting the short end of the stick and they're getting pushed out closer to people, whereas like the tigers are having like a nice time, you know, at the core of the, the protected area, whereas the sloth is kind of forced away from the tiger and out closer to people where inevitably it gets into conflicts with, with them. Brilliant, well, thank you for that. We've got Dana and many, many more wondering where you went to school and what the most valuable lesson you learned was. Uh, okay, so I went, I did my undergrad. I'm actually in Canada at the moment. So I went to school at the University of Western Ontario for my undergraduate degree. And then I did my master's in journalism at the University of Colorado. Um, and I think, I mean, I, a couple of things for me, I think the really most important part of my education was getting involved in a student newspaper. Um, that was really kind of what laid the foundation. And, and that's something that you can even get, you know, yearbook or newspapers, even at the middle school or high school level. I think getting that education really early on helped me a lot. Um, and then also, I think just, just networking, like meeting other people who were doing work in this field was really invaluable for me, especially when I was doing my master's because I got to meet, you know, a lot of journalists who were doing what I wanted to do and they were traveling the world and they were reporting on cool animals. So just kind of talking to those people and, and getting advice from them. Amazing. Well, let's take a question from an on-screen student. Let's go to Andrew. Andrew, your microphone's on. What's your question? Um, well, my question is mainly regarding wolves in Oregon. I'm a very big wolf enthusiast and I was wondering what was your work there about? Yeah, so I was looking at um, a lot of the Western states have these programs known as uh, wolf compensation programs, wherein if you lose a cow or like a sheep to a wolf, uh, you get paid money for it because the, you know, the government will give you money to, to um, reimburse you for your loss. I mean, so I was looking into some issues. It's, it's really difficult to kind of prove that a wolf actually killed your animal. And so sort of looking at some of the issues that might relate to that with people saying, oh, a wolf has clearly killed my cow when it was a coyote or like the cow fell down a ditch, like it had nothing to do with a wolf and kind of how that, how that might help or inhibit like public sentiment towards wolves. Um, and what I kind of found was that really like these compensation programs have been around for a long time, but they haven't really changed attitudes toward wolves like they were supposed to. People actually perhaps have a worse impression of wolves as opposed to being more, more open to the return of, return of wolves in the West. Interesting. All right, let's take a question from the Lidovstead family. Your microphone's on. Okay. What's the rarest animal you have photographed? Weirdest animal. Well, I don't photograph too much, um, so I'm mostly writing. Um, weirdest animal. Um, I mean, I think the abalone is a pretty weird looking animal. It's very cute and like <laughs> kind of slimy looking. Um, coolest animal. I actually have really bad wildlife luck though, in terms of seeing them in the wild. Like I'm the one person who will never, you know, everyone else goes out and sees all the monkeys and the anteaters and the tapirs. And I'm like, I've missed everything. So I'm probably not the best person to ask about that. Well, here's a question, maybe a little closer to home then. We've got Tiana and some others who are interested in getting involved in wildlife journalism, but are wondering how to start doing that from home. Yeah, I mean, I think um, there's lots of backyard and urban wildlife uh, that you can kind of look at. I was really into squirrels when I was a kid. Um, I would spend hours like taking photos of squirrels and learning everything I could about squirrels in Ontario. Um, so I think, you know, keeping a journal about those things that you might see in your own backyard um, and sort of reading the local newspaper too to see what's happening. What are some of the species that are facing issues in your region? Um, lots of places have like a wildlife rehab center. That's a good place to look if you're looking for ideas to maybe start practicing. Um, I would like start my own little like newspapers in my room as a kid too. So you could do something like that. Love that. We've got Alessandro online who says, I reckon wildlife photographers can really help raise awareness regarding environmental issues. Do you, Gloria, feel like your work has made an impact so far? 
Yeah, I, was, I think it's, I think a lot of people get into this field because they want to make that impact. Um, and I think it can sometimes be a little bit difficult to measure. Um, but maybe some people here, for example, didn't know what a sloth bear was before today, and now they do, and they'll think of that moving forward. Um, so I think it's something that happens slowly and incrementally, especially with wildlife. It's, it's hard to just suddenly save a species. No one's gonna read one story and suddenly the tiger has been saved. Um, but I think it builds you know, upon each, each thing moving forward. So hopefully the new generations can make a difference when they're exposed to these kinds of species from a young age. We've got a couple of general questions about sloth bears. So I'm gonna ask them all in a row. How big are they? Okay, um, they are a little bit smaller than the American black bear. So I think around like 250 pounds, if that makes sense. Yeah, they're not, they're not huge. They're much smaller than grizzlies and, and polar bears. All right, do you know how they got the name sloth bear? I do. <laughs> so the thought is that um, obviously they're not a sloth, but uh, some of the early explorers were traveling uh, through India and they saw this like shaggy weird animal like hanging in a tree and they'd been to South America and they'd seen sloths there. And so they thought that it was uh, a sloth and not a bear. I think they originally called it bear sloth. And it wasn't actually until the 1800s when um, an uh, institution in Paris got, a, got an actual sample of a sloth bear that they realized that it was a bear and uh, not, <laughs> not of the sloth family. Um, and they're actually not very slow either. Some people think it's like they must be like slow and slothingly, um, but they're very, very fast. Fascinating. The pattern on their chest, is it always the same? It can, it can deviate a little bit. A lot of the Asiatic bear species have those markings. So that's why some people I think said moon bear or sun bear earlier, because they also have those golden kind of V-shaped uh, chest markings. Um, you might see a little bit of variation and it might be like smaller or bigger on some species, but more or less that, that stays the same. All right, and for folks in India, is there a strategy they use if they encounter a sloth bear? Some people have been mentioning like with some American bears, the wisdom is to play dead. Is, is there anything like that? I was just having a very vigorous debate with this with a friend of mine who's uh, photographing sloth bears yesterday. And he had said that uh, Indian scientists have never documented anyone being killed by a sloth bear after they fell to the ground and covered their head. Um, because sloth bears do tend to attack more defensively as well. They're not predatory. Um, you know, in, in America, we would say if it's black, fight back. If it's brown, lie down. Whereas uh, grizzlies will also attack defensively. So you want to make yourself small and make yourself not so much of a threat. And um, that typically works uh, with sloth bears as well. Brilliant. Well, that's our sloth bear questions for now. If you have more sloth bear questions, please feel free to ask them. Don't feel limited, but let's move on and go to the Singh family for a, for a new question. Oh, we have two. The first one is, what inspired you to become a wildlife journalist? Yeah, so I really loved animals growing up and I also really loved books and reading and storytelling. And as I mentioned, I did not like math. And so I was trying to look at a way that I could still work with animals and, and cover animals and write about them, but not have to go through school for like chemistry or physics or math. Um, and so I kind of turned to, to writing about these animals. Um, and I think, Part of that too that I really like is like often scientists are specializing in one species or one animal or one location. Uh, as a wildlife journalist, I'm able to travel to all different locations and cover all different species, which I really enjoy. So I'm not just, you know, pigeonholed into doing, you know, sharks or something like that. I can cover all different species. Brilliant. And then I heard you had another question saying family, so go for it. What's that second question? And the second question is, what's your favorite place you visited before? Um, I really like Western China. So I was there um, in Sichuan province a couple of years ago and I was looking at panda bears and they had golden snub nosed monkeys and just an incredible array of wildlife. Um, and I think China kind of doesn't get enough recognition as like the spectacular place to visit for its wilderness. Um, so I think, yeah, far and above, I really liked Western China and uh, also kind of into the Tibetan plateau as well. I think the people were really nice. It's really different culture and very interesting. And yeah, the wild animals were just spectacular. Brilliant. We've got Pete on YouTube who's wondering, as you're writing your bear book, how many bears have you seen? So maybe how many different types of bears? And then do you have a guess for how many individual bears you've seen? <laughs> well, I guess I've seen, I've seen every species of bear in person, but not all of those were wild bears. So I've seen sloth bears in the wild with cubs. We had, um, I was staying at some forest cabins when I was in India and we had a mother with two cubs come in to eat by one of the trees outside. And so we were all kind of hiding uh, behind a car for protection while we watched her with like a flashlight and then we'd like run into the car whenever she started to move uh, to hide from her. Um, 
And then I've seen, I've been to like the panda breeding centers in China. I've seen polar bears in the wild. I've seen grizzly bears in the wild and black bears. Um, and then with moon bears and sun bears, I've only seen those uh, on uh, in, in rehabilitation or refuge centers in Asia. Those ones are pretty pretty tricky to see in the wild as are, as are pandas. Um, and also the spectacled bear in Peru. I spent a month tracking that bear, but did not see one in the wild. Uh, but I did see them again at um, some local sanctuaries. Awesome. Let's go to Sophia for a question. Sophia? Um, yes. My sister had a question. Um, she was asking how many different types of uh, bears are there? Like how many different species? Yeah, so there's eight species globally. There's a couple subspecies within there too. So like people will say a grizzly bear is actually a subspecies of brown bear, um, but I can list, list them again for you. It's polar bear, uh, American black bear, the Asiatic black bear, also called the moon bear, the sun bear, the sloth bear, the panda bear, spectacled bear, and sun, did I say sun bear? Black bear, grizzly bear, brown bear, yeah. <laughs> Hopefully that got them all. Love it. And Sophia, do you have another question of your own now that you ask your sisters? Um, no. All right. Love that. We'll see the floor back to our YouTube commenters. We've got an awful lot of questions there. Lisa is wondering how close, Gloria, do you get to animals and how do you plan for safety when you're reporting? Yeah. So as I mentioned, we were kind of like hiding behind a car <laughs> in that instance. Um, when we were like hiking in India, we had guides who would come with us who had like machetes and things like that. Um, Typically, the idea is not to get that close. I'm not a photographer, so I don't necessarily need to be like right up there in the action for that or like with a long lens. Um, so it's definitely precautions that we take. You know, typically the biggest concerns are like poisonous or venomous snakes as opposed to like the bears coming at us. Um, but definitely that was something that I was thinking about in India. You know, you're documenting the super aggressive bear and then you're going to go look for it or you're going to go look into its habitat. Um, one area that we were in like there were lots of like bear dens that like leopards lived in and bears were also denning in so we kind of gave that a kind of wide uh berth as we as we walked around all right we've got uh eli and kira who are wondering what your favorite species that you've studied is and maybe you could give us a little description of why yeah <laughs> i was trying to think of like what my favorite bear is i think um it's very, it's like choosing between children. It's very difficult. I do really like polar bears because I really like the Arctic as well. Um, and I think the polar bear feels so different from the other species of bear. It's very majestic and it's also very in trouble too. Um, so I think that one's typically the one that I'm like most excited for to see. Um, and it's like, so, I mean, you saw what a soft bear looks like. They're very cute, but they're also like very, like, they're kind of like the shaggy dumpy bear. Like they're like, look a little bit like homeless or something. I don't know. Whereas like the polar bear is very um, awe inspiring when you see one. And was there another part to that? Um, and why is it your favorite? Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Love it. Uh, can sloth bears swim? That's a good question. I'm not sure. I don't, I don't think so. I mean, they don't really tend to live in areas with lots of water to begin with. So they wouldn't necessarily be, be doing, I mean, I'm, I'm not, I'm not sure though. It's not their like main hobby. <laughs> right. We've got uh, Tiana Sermons, who's wondering how you feel about zoos as a wildlife reporter. Um, so I think there's a huge description of what we kind of, you know, there's a huge de definition of what a zoo is. Um, in terms of the, you know, accredited zoos, I'm fully on board with uh, the mission of zoos. But I think, you know, when we're thinking of things like roadside zoos or, you know, things like the Tiger King that some of you might have heard about recently, that's uh, a whole different ballgame. And that's something that I definitely would not uh, support. I think, you know, a lot of zoos like San Diego Zoo Global have been really instrumental in global conservation and captive breeding initiatives, um, and, and their work is really important. Brilliant. We've got a question from Rhonda, who's wondering how you would define a charismatic animal. What does that mean? Hmm. Well, I mean, so I, I was doing a little bit of research as to like why people find pandas so cute, like neuro neuroscientists have looked into this and it's kind of, you know, the big patches around its eyes and it's kind of like a big head to body ratio and it, therefore it makes us think of like human babies. Uh, I think there's a lot of kind of science actually behind why we find certain animals charismatic versus other ones like abalone, not so charismatic. Um, so there's definitely the cuteness factor. There's definitely like the bigger the animal, the furrier the animal tends to make them more charismatic. Um, but I feel like a lot of the stories that I've done too, like I did a story on like maggot farming and the maggots were really interesting. It's not just, you know, it's not just how, <laughs> how cute a species is in terms of their conservation value. And that's really important. 
Brilliant. If you're up on screen with me, would you give me a wave if you've got another question? All right, let's go to the Liedlstubbs family. Yeah. What is the biggest feline you have? Uh, what, what is the biggest feline you have photographed? The biggest feline? Feline, yeah. Cat? Um, have I seen any wild? I haven't really seen it. I don't really do wild cats, so I don't know. Just the bears, really. And I'm not really, yeah, I'm not taking too many photos. So I guess a, I guess a house cat would be my answer. <laughs> there are some pretty big house cats out there. But there's some fat ones, yep. <laughs> totally. Uh, give me a wave if you've got another question. How about the Singh family? Your microphone's on. Um, what is the average lifespan of a sloth bear? Yeah, so most bears live around like, they're fairly long lived. They live, they live around like 20 to 25 years. It depends if they're in captivity or the wild. Um, but yeah, bears can live for a fairly long time um, compared to some other species. Dana is wondering where in the U.S. you've worked. Have you worked in any of the major U.S. forests? Um, yep, so I used to live in Colorado, so I was covering a lot of the areas around there. So Yellowstone, North Cascades, Sequoia National Park, um, Yosemite National Park, kind of all those areas I've done, done different uh, bear reporting and wolf reporting <laughs> and things like that. But mostly, mostly in the Western U.S., also a little bit in Alaska, and also I've done some reporting on birds in Hawaii as well. Brilliant. And that kind of leads into our next question of how much time do you typically spend traveling? Yeah. So for the past uh, three years, I've kind of been fairly nomadic. I didn't rent or keep an apartment. I was just traveling constantly um, to report this book and to report on all these different animals. Um, but I think typically it would probably be like half the year in a normal year. Um, that's obviously changed with the current uh, pandemic, but I spent a lot of time in airports and in airplanes and on the road. Um, and a reporting trip might range from like one week to like two months. So it can be pretty short or pretty, pretty long, depending on the story. Awesome. We've got kind of a controversial question. Isabella is asking you to pick your least favorite bear. <laughs> I've never thought about that one. Oh, um, hmm. I feel like, oh yeah. I guess like the American black bear, just because I feel like it's like the most common bear and I grew up with that bear too. So it's kind of like, it gets a lot of attention as it is. I don't think it needs more like conservation attention. Um, there's hundreds of thousands of American black bears. Um, it's not to say that I dislike American black bears, but it wasn't one that I was like, you know, compared to the moon bear or the spectacled bear, it's not quite as uh, exciting perhaps having grown up so close to that bear. <laughs> that feels very mean though. That's all right. We won't hold it against you and we won't tell the bears. Give me a wave if you've got another question. All right, let's go to Sophia. So are there any bears that you haven't seen? Um, so I've seen all the, I've seen them all in person. I just haven't seen them all in the wild. And I think like for a panda, I saw a wild panda poop, which was apparently very exciting. Like the guards were like, this is a huge deal. And it was six months old, but no one ever sees, you know, pandas are so elusive. There's only a thousand eight, 800 left, uh, you know, in the wild. So even seeing like panda poo was like really apparently quite, quite a big deal for us. <laughs> what a weird thing to get bragging rights for. Learn something new every day. Um, we've got some folks online wondering how you're going to celebrate Earth Day, Gloria. Um, well, from home, I guess to start, you know, probably turning off the lights, not eating, you know, animal products. I'm not too sure what else we can, we can do right now. I'm still writing wildlife stories pretty much every week though too. So same old, same old. <laughs> Brilliant. And I know our, uh, friends in Peru have another question. Let's turn your microphone on. Go for it. Yeah, uh, have you um, uh, made a research on a spectacled bear? And another question is, uh, uh, where was the research station in Peru you mentioned? And are you coming back to Peru? <laughs> I hope so. Um, yeah, I was there uh, last summer for a month and I was um, at, it was a place called Waycatcha Biological Station. It's kind of on the edge of Manu National Park. Um, it's about four hours from Cusco. Um, and so there's a lot of researchers doing um, studies there on the cloud forests, uh, which is where the spectacled bear often lives um, and kind of how the bears use those forests. So I was, I was tagging along with them for a few weeks as they checked the cameras um, because not, not, it's one of like, I think spectacled bears are some of the least known bears in terms of like how much how many how big their population is where they are in South America that's kind of um that was a really exciting trip it was we didn't get to see a bear but we saw lots of them on the on the camera traps uh, there were several spectacled bears that had walked by um and so 
think does that answer everything? <laughs> but there's, certainly there's there throughout Peru. Yeah, like Paddington. In here we have Paddington. <laughs> Brilliant. We've got some folks wondering, Gloria, what's the next project you hope to check off your bu bucket list? <sighs> I have so many projects and now we'll have to see what happens with them. Um, let's see. I would like, I was actually thinking I'd like to do something on um, the koala bears and the bushfires. They're going to start captive breeding them now. So I think that that will be a really important story to see what happens with that. They've never captive bred koalas before, but after so many were killed in the kill them in the bushfires this year. They're hoping to try and restore the, the wild population. So I think that will be a, hopefully a good one to do. And is there a typical amount of time that you spend on any wildlife story? <laughs> it can take from like four months to like a year. Um, yeah, bears I've been on to for quite some time because I'm working on a very long project with that. Um, but yeah, I think sometimes like from start to finish on a typical wildlife feature story would be at least a year. So it's a commitment. Wow, love that. All right, Gloria, we'll end with the same question we always end with. Do you have any advice for the young explorers joining us today? I would say, I mean, if this is something that you're interested in, just like follow your passion, get involved. I gave some tips about like, you know, student yearbook or student newspapers and start thinking about like what's, you know, what's around you um, and, you know, call into things like this, connect with other people doing this kind of work and ask them your questions as you kind of grow up and move along because they're gonna hopefully open some doors for you in the future. Brilliant. And if folks have questions about your work, is there any way that they could find more of it? Anywhere you want to direct them to? Yeah. I mean, you can find my Twitter. It's just my name, Gloria Dickey. It's in the slides as well. Um, I also have my own website, www.gloriadickey.com. And you can shoot me an email too. And I can share that information somehow too if you need it. Perfect. Well, everybody at home, keep the conversation going on Twitter using the hashtag Explorer Classroom and tagging at Nat Geo Education. Please be sure to check out Explorer Classroom plus many, many more amazing educational resources at natgeoed.org. I hope to see you at some of our upcoming events. Tomorrow at 2 p.m. Eastern, we'll have the event Amazing Animals with Lucy Cook. She's a zoologist who has a soft spot in her heart for all of the like weird, wild, wacky, rare creatures that are out there. She's going to help us celebrate Earth Day with a closer look at the very misunderstood animals she's met over the course of her career. But for now, all these students up on screen, let's say goodbye and thank you to Gloria for all of her time and her wonderful presentation today. I'm going to turn on all Bye. the microphones. Ready? Bye. Thanks. Bye, guys. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.